truthfully, it was those sessions that the way he pushed me and the fact that he didn't let us cheat, and you know this, that trained me up to be able to play this stuff live. Like I probably went into those studios not able to play this stuff very well. And by the time I left, <laughs> I could. And with calculating, I still don't know how we did it because we didn't have that much time in the studio. We didn't have the technology. There weren't multiple players. It was just really just, I just don't know how, we, I don't know fucking idea how we, we got it done. Hey everyone, welcome back to another episode of The Record Process. This week, things get a little complex. As we sit down with the guitarist and one of the primary songwriters of the Dillinger Escape Plan, Mr. Ben Wyman. We discuss the creation of their 1999 debut record, Calculating Infinity, that interestingly enough, was actually produced by a Record Process alumni guest from episode 36, Mr. Steve Evitz. Throughout our conversation with Ben, we explore how writing technically complex music without a music theory background became a form of medicine for Wyman's ADHD. He talks about a group of guys who had thrown out their expectations of music as a viable career and how that was the same group that ultimately started a force and a movement in the metal community that would go on to be known as one of the most technically inventive bands of their time. Ben talks about the happy accidents that began to emerge during the band's writing and performing, and how leaning into those accidents is what ultimately made Dillinger work as a band. And it's all coming up right now. The task of making a great album is rarely a solo endeavor, and companies like Audio Movers help empower musicians and creators by streamlining their workflow together and enabling them to make more efficient and informed creative choices. Famous for their groundbreaking collaborative plugin tool, Listen To, Audio Movers have made it possible to stream audio files in real time directly from your doll to anyone anywhere in the world. And recently, Audio Movers have expanded their dynamic plugin suite with Inject an impressive audio routing solution that allows users to route audio in and out of any channel in your DAW. And alongside Inject stands the newly updated Omnibus 2.0, a software application that turns your Mac into a virtual patch bay, making it possible to route audio between applications and hardware seamlessly. And you can get 25% off Inject and Omnibus right now by heading to audiomovers.com and entering the code RECORD-PRO at checkout. With over a million plus artists already relying on DistroKid to get their music into Spotify, Apple Music, YouTube, TikTok, Tidal, Instagram, and all the major streaming platforms, you may have heard of it before. But if you're not yet familiar with just how easy DistroKid makes unlimited uploads and retaining 100% of your artist royalties and earnings, now is the time to finally see for yourself. And that's because they've just supercharged the functionality of their platform with the recent release of their new iOS app. The app allows you to upload new releases, check your streaming stats from Spotify and Apple, edit release metadata, and you can even set push notifications that will alert you every time you've earned royalties that you can withdraw right from the app. In addition to getting your music uploaded to DSPs faster than any competitor, DistroKid also has a ton of great promotional tools that can help you market your music better. You can view and share hyperfollow links and allow fans to pre-save your songs in advance, get the credits and lyrics for your songs instantly uploaded, and you can do all this for just $22.99 a year. So head to the App Store and download the DistroKid app for free now. Ben Wyman, welcome to the record process. Thanks so much for joining us, buddy. Uh, we really appreciate you making the time. Thanks, guys. Thanks, uh, Casey. Thanks, Tom. We wanted to ask you here, right? Um, obviously, you've you've had your hands in so many projects over the years, um, and, and truly, it's it's really astounding. But we, specifically, we wanted to zero in on your band that I'm sure a lot of people do know, um, know you as the guitar player for, um, and, uh, one of the primary songwriters of the Dillinger escape plan, which has had a huge impact on the world of, well, uh, a lot of, uh, a lot of sub genres, right? It's, I, I think that's honestly some of the, the lore and intrigue about the band is, you know, how do you really even 
Dillinger escape plan is kind of in a, a category of its own, I think in some ways. Um, and that's, that's part of the reason why we wanted to have you here and talk about the debut full length calculating infinity that came out in 99. So yeah. How's that sound for you? Uh, there's so much, that we, there's so much that we could have talked about. Honestly, it was tough to narrow it down and I'm sure every record we, there could have been, um, a, a really robust episode on, but yeah, we figured we would start there for a number of reasons. But like I said, that, that record came out in 99, but that wasn't the first thing the band had done. Right. So for anybody that's maybe not familiar with like the initial origin of Dillinger, why don't you like paint, paint a picture of kind of what, um, what led y'all up to that, um, up to the making of that album? Yeah. So I think, you know, I, I think it's important to, to mention that we had all done, um, bands throughout high school and we all thought they were going to be the ones the ones that make it. And I think we can all relate to creating bands that essentially sound like the bands we like or the bands that are popular or we think will push us forward in music. And those earlier bands were just like, uh, we just wanted to be in bands. You know, bands were cool. We played covers. Uh, we wanted to do, that's what we knew. That's what we did well. That's mm -hmm. what we were interested in playing music. So we did it. And it fairly quickly, it seemed pretty impossible to make it in music. Like uh, it just seemed uh, none of us had connections. We were from the suburbs of Jersey. It's not like any of us had an uncle in the business or anything like that. <laughs> yeah. Hopefully there's somebody in the band who's more like kind of uh, a connector and someone who wants to go to shows and, and pass out flyers and do that kind of thing. And then there's the guys in the bands who, you know, who just kind of want to play all the time and hide in the basement and hope someone will, just find them, you know, and sometimes it's that combination that creates something, you know, that works. Um, and so, uh, I think, you know, the bands I was in earlier were like, we were all just trying to connect with people and get shows and make it, you know, mm. and we weren't really that concerned with the music. Um, so eventually I kind of gave up on that, went to school for psychology, uh, eventually even started working a corporate job. And Dillinger was kind of a combination of guys from bands that were like, we, we just gave up, you know, we weren't part mm -hmm. of any click. Nobody cared about our music. I remember guys from labels in the scene, taking our demos and throwing them in the garbage, like watching them do it, you know, and stuff like that. And um, so we just didn't think it was possible. We were pretty angry. We were pretty annoyed with everyone. It, the young thing, you know, young angst. And, um, <laughs> I think the one thing that um, changed between the time of when we started the band and when we ended the band is, is emotional maturity. And it takes that kind of, I think, anger and, uh, you know, a, a body full of, of poisonous semen of a young person <laughs> who's just raging and wants to like just, you know, go on 11 all the time to make something sometimes. But, you know, I, I think we were always pointing outward, like a lot of the aggressive bands, like, fuck you, you do this, you do that, da, 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 da. And I think one of the reasons we ended was because we were done doing that. We could look internally now and say, uh, we take responsibility for our ourselves and, and our, our everything. And so we've kind of reached the end of the, of the, uh, of the game. You know, we can move on now and, and, Dillinger took care of that for us, you know? Yeah. So the purpose of the band was literally just to vent and just, just to get things off our chest. And we were all into more eclectic music than the typical hardcore scene was. was. So we liked that scene because you, as you know, like you could go play a show in a VFW hall. You could, it was possible. You didn't have to be part of some, you didn't have to sign to some big label or sell a thousand tickets at some local club to play a gig or things like that. There was accessibility. So we liked the fact that people were just doing it themselves. You could just go somewhere and play. But we came from, we were listening to extreme music way early on in our, in our young lives. We were listening to just ex the most extreme death metal. And then by the time we started making, really making bands, we were pretty much desensitized to a lot of stuff. It was very just like stamina based. <laughs> like this guy plays double bass like really fast, you know, this guy shreds really fast. And it wasn't, it kind of got old. It was like, okay, this guy, it's like, it's, it's athletic, you know? Yeah. I, I was going <laughs> to yeah. say it's for sport. <laughs> it's sport. Yeah, this, yeah. There wasn't a whole lot of people reinventing the wheel in that, in that world. Yeah. 
What were some of the, what were some of those influences, Ben? Because I'm curious. I'm sure some people we talk about influences a lot, and you mentioned those those being really formative. What were some of those almost athletic, uh, athletically charged influences you had been listening to? Yeah, I mean, we we were listening to yeah, like Deicide and like Morbid Angel and um, just Carcass, and and a lot of that was great for sure. Before long, it wasn't really like we were finding anything that was reinventing the wheel, kind of so 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 much and. So uh, we started getting into more like fusion and things like that. And also electronic music like Aphex Twin and Square Pusher and things that were just sounded seemingly random and super innovative from a technological level, from a songwriting level. Um, and, but a lot of that stuff was stuff that seemed not really human or possible, you know? So when we started Dillinger, we like were using the scene as an opportunity to play, but we were really like listening to all this fusion and crazy electronic music with the background of just heavy, heavy aggression as well. I'm very proud of the fact when when artists who don't sound like Dillinger say we were an influence because that's how we really became what we were. You know, we were influenced by the attitudes of bands or the the why why people did the things they did, mm -hmm. the impact they had on people, the controversy, the mythology, things like that, more than like sounding like them. You know, like we, we were influenced by the black flags and, and the stories and the mythology around this band and, and the riots and the craziness. And we were in, into, you know, the bad brains and things like that. But like, we love that mythology. We love the stories behind those bands, but that's like, we weren't going to make a band that sounded like that. We really wanted to use our influence to create something, but we wanted to have the same kind of impact. We wanted to be polarizing. We wanted to be in people's faces. And that was the only way we were going to really achieve what we needed from an emotional level. Yeah, that's kind of how Dillinger came to be. If you were to take like one example of how a band puts that into actual musicality, is there like an example that like comes up in your head of like, this is how Dillinger put the why into our music? Like specifically like, like the lore and the story of like Black Flag and like how like that influenced y'all. How, what, how did that influence show up in Dillinger? Like was, was there like any type of like musical aspect that you were like, oh, you know what? fuck y'all we're putting this in here like was there any moments like that yeah i think more specifically from like a live performance place because we had gotten into all these bands i think you know it's probably like i got into rollins band because it was more commercial in my age and things like that and then i got into black flag and then you know i was into Rations machine and, and then i got into inside out which is mm -hmm. zach's hardcore band and then i got into because of the spirituality and i got to like 108 because you know, Vic from from Inside Out was in 108, which was a Krishna band. And I got into Shelter and then I got into, um, you know, some of the political, all that stuff. But it seemed like the bands, the next wave of hardcore that was coming after that had all the, you know, bad three chord riffs, but none of the purpose, yeah, you know? Totally. <laughs> and totally. all those bad three chord riffs were part of the purpose back then. Mm -hmm. it, the point was that like it didn't, you didn't have to be great at your instrument. It just had to be, uh, had purpose. It had to really, there had to be, you had to believe it. Yeah. You had to mean it. Yeah. I think, dude, that is so important. And we're going to get into um, kind of, you know, then finding the puzzle pieces and the other people to kind of help, you know, continue that, uh, that exploration for you. But, um, this might, this is kind of a big segue too, because one of the things, um, our, our mutual friend here, Mr. Steve Evitz, uh, who is about to make his way into this storyline. Um, one of the things that I always love about him and that he has impressed upon us and that I try to impress upon a lot of other bands as well is listen, if you're in the studio or live, whatever it is, if you're going to make a mistake, if you're going to mess up, just mean it, just own it. You know what I mean? Don't give me right. the, like the half ass, like kind of unsure mistake. Like you messed up because you were thinking about not making a mistake. If you're going to do it, just mean it and lean into it. Um, and I love that because that is exactly the kind of attitude I think you're talking about. And I think that shows up in everything I've ever seen Dillinger do and everything that comes out on these records. It's intentional, but not from a place of let's make this like perfect. Although there is uh, a very high degree uh, of performance. No, you're absolutely um, right. But uh, but yeah, I, I mean, and so I guess that's a perfect time to transition into 
how did you then take, you know, that kind of attitude and those influences that you had been starting to collect and, and mold together, um, you know, had made some music before that, that was maybe circling and pulling some of those influences in, but then it came time to, to really kind of like put your mark on it with a, with a full length. How did you get hooked up with Steve Evitz? That's a perfect segue right there because the truth is, is like, you know, our first demos, we did a six song kind of demo that came out as a six song album uh, early on. And that was kind of like, it had some elements of the, of the Dillinger people know, but it was still pretty indicative of some of the like local hardcore bands and things like that. But it was really like those kind of happy accidents and leaning into them that started to really form what Dillinger sounded like, you know? So in some of those early releases, there was things that kind of like really worked or really sounded the combination of us players doing something that we like were trying to almost emulate in another artist, or maybe it was from a different context or it was not like a, an artist that was like punk, but we made it punk, whatever. Um, we'd be like, okay, that, that like more of that, you know, and less of that, you know? And so people responded to certain elements of what we were doing, which was just kind of by mistake. It's just as how it came out when, us guys put it together, particularly Chris, our drummer and me would get in a room and we just push each other. And he was more technical. I was more punk guy. You know, he <laughs> pushed me technically. And I pushed him to like hit the drums harder and, you know, and bash cymbals and things and like not worry <laughs> about the intricacies. And, and it was like this put tug and pull that started to create what eventually was the Tillinger sound. And one of the things, um, like you said, in the studio, uh, when we started working with Steve was, um, he was also really good at like looking at little mistakes and happy accents and be like, Oh, that's cool. Let's, let's lean into that, you know? Um, and then those things became part of the vocabulary that were later often repeated in, in our albums that became kind of our signature things. I love taking bands and looking at their story of like how they, the dots you can connect mm -hmm. to where they got, where they were from watching the beginning. And often a lot of these artists that end up, becoming a big name or having a big influence started by just kind of following their heroes, you know? So like Nirvana loved the Melvins and Buzz yeah. took Kurt to the shows. He was like his little brother, you know, and took him all the shows and stuff, whatever. And he, th those guys love sub pop. And so where does everyone record who does those albums? Oh, yeah. this studio. We'll go there. Yep. And then they go there and the guy's like, you know what? This is pretty cool. Let me send it to my boy at Sub Pop, see if he wants to put it out. Okay, put out seven inch. Boom, boom. You know what I mean? It just right. yeah. kind of goes yeah. and goes. And the end goal, they never thought they'd be where they were. It was just like, oh, these are the bands I like. Where do they record? That's mm -hmm. the first yeah. dot. And yeah. that's what we did. Like all the bands in our area that sounded decent, like sounded actually good. The recording, like, you know, you'd have these hardcore bands and local punk bands and they sounded like whatever local recordings. And then you'd hear something Steve did. And it's like, it's, this sounds like a real album. Yeah. Yeah. This yeah. sounds real. Like this sounds like a professionally produced album. There's a difference here. Yeah. And so, um, we were like, okay, this, the bands that sound good, go to this guy in, in Jersey. So, and we're in Jersey. So let me call this guy. And that's how it started. Wow. Love that. Oh, that's awesome. I, that's a, that truly is. Um, I mean, yeah, it seems so simple yet. You're right. Um, it, it really takes finding your path and hoping that you, you know, come along people in that, you know, in that lineage and in those threads that instead of trying to put you into a certain mold, you know, to put you in the industry, will take the, the opposite look and say, these are the weird fucked up things that actually, are going to make you bigger than all of these other bands potentially, you know what I mean? And, and you never really know, but a guy like Steve is someone that wants to take that chance and wants to see it, wants to stop. And y'all were the perfect band that literally, you know, was just, was amassing something that would have been destroyed if you tried to fit it into another mold, you know? Um, and so I right. love that. So it seems so serendipitous but also so intentionful, you know, it's like it, it came because of his influences and the record he had already, the records he had already made, which brought y'all to gravitate towards him and the feeling in there. And he was working out of a studio called tracks East, right? Which is, uh, we never got the opportunity to, to do anything out of that studio. Steve had moved to LA by the time we started working mm -hmm. with him with wonder years. But one of the biggest things that I kind of want to dive into, especially for such a technical band as y'all and everything that I, I've come to know and love about Steve's process is the fact that y'all weren't doing this in the like 
measure yeah, it was, by measure it was overdub 99. Pro Tools area. This was this <laughs> yeah. was 99, 98, 98, right? Mm -hmm. So talk to me about that. You and Chris and the band are writing really, really out there stuff right now. You know, things that will turn on a dime, have really angular, jarring changes stylistically, you know, rhythmically. And someone might say, well, sure, uh, you can do that. We can re just record a couple measures at a time and we'll piece it all together. Mm -hmm. That's not at all what really happened here because Steve was recording to tape at that studio. A lot of those records right. you heard were done to tape. So let's yeah. talk about that. And when you all came in, had you done the previous EPs, anything you had done to tape? Or was it, you know, was this the first time that you were like, we're doing this and we're committing? Well, no, we did the a six song EP with him. Which okay. Space good demo, and then we did our right. three song EP after that under the running board with him as well, which was the first thing uh, Relapse released. Like, yeah. That was basically kind of what got us signed. Yeah. And then we like mm. gave it to them as a freebie. Yeah. You know, we're like, look, you can put this out if, uh, to keep to start building on the future full length. We'll be working on with you, and that was very attractive to them. But um, truthfully, um, we had no idea that Steve had so much of the same influential background. We had no idea that Steve. While Steve obviously had very technical recording abilities and a great ear, we never knew he could understand the time signatures and the crazy stuff at the level that he did. Like he really, really was able to digest this stuff. He got it. Like he knew where we were coming from. He didn't hear it and be like, okay, what the fuck's going on? He knew exactly how this needed to be delivered in order to make the most sense. And he understood it. So I don't think we could have done something like this, like recorded to tape and things like that so well, if it weren't for someone like Steve who knew how to punch in on an odd, odd time signature. Or right. like, and we were lucky enough that he was extremely musically gifted and was a fan of, of all kinds of interesting, uh, weird music that, that was uh, really a good base for doing this with him. So that was lucky. Yeah. That was really lucky. No, it so as far as the like the tracking process, mm -hmm. did y'all lay down like basics like live or did was it like drums? I'm trying to remember. <laughs> I, yeah, yeah. Like, I mean, well, I, yeah. <laughs> yeah. How do you how do you how do you approach it? I guess that's the million dollar question with a band like Dillinger is how how do you, you where do you start? Right. Well, I think it's important to say also that like we did the three song EP, which is really the first Dillin really Dillinger sounding. Mm -hmm. Like, okay, this is what made people listen. You know, yeah. I remember we sent that song out to a few people, like friends of people that we, bands we liked and friends. And like, uh, one of them was um, Nate Newton, who later went on to play in uh, Converge, but he was in this band Jesuit and um, they were doing a tour with the band Botch. Mm -hmm. We sent Nate uh, the, the tape of Under the Running Board and he was like, what the fuck is this? Holy shit. And he's like, you guys just got to come on this tour with us. So, you know, our first real tour was uh, Jesuit Botch Dillinger. Crazy tour. And it was really, really interesting because we were all just in vans, like playing any shithole we could. It was very, a real education in um, what it's like to have healthy competition and have that as a driving force because we were all friends. We all enjoyed watching each other, but we all fucking we're like fuck this band's so good we gotta do better <laughs> you know it was kind of like a combination of i love this band but we gotta do better you know fuck yeah. they're great they're great you know that was a great i think thing for all those bands that would tour together and things like that and we weren't kind of just youtube warriors and things like that yeah. like mm. we all just got in a room and pushed each other but after doing that ep which was really like much more technical and aggressive and just intense than the things we had done before. Our bass player got in a car accident mm. and was paralyzed right before we were getting ready to do our first full length. Um, and then our guitar, our the guitar player was like more technical than I am. Like I was doing like the songwriting and, but he would like show me something, some jazz thing or something. And I'd be like, huh, that's cool. Let me turn that into something super crazy. He was the one reading books and this, that. And then he yeah. would show it to me and I'd be like, that's really interesting. Now let me put it through like a, a grindcore punk lens, you know, <laughs> but I wasn't the one who was like technical. I wasn't sitting there. Like I was, I, you know, I came from blues and mm -hmm. punk and like, you know, I liked like metal, but I wasn't sitting around sweeping or tapping or like playing guitar. I was out watching 
bands and running around. I just never really practiced or anything, you know? So this dude was like, you know, I didn't think this was going to work. I never expected us to get signed. I'm kind of into the computer science thing. I'm going to school. I don't really want to commit to this. He quit. And so essentially musically, it was just me and Chris, our drummer. And now it's like, okay, now do a full length of this stuff, which I was just kind of like almost the conductor, you know? Mm -hmm. Uh Uh-huh. Yep. And I was like, what the fuck, you know? A daunting task ahead. Yeah. (laughs) Which even bears like from a compositional standpoint. So you had had some of those more like heady kind of like theory based ideas coming in from this person. But then, you know, they decide to leave the band before before then, um, before the recording of this album. But so you're left over with all of those influences, you know. And things that had been working and especially too, because I mean, listening to this album, you, you see that, but then there are other, you know, if you read some interviews either, you know, that you did at the time, you're talking about how you kind of, the whole idea was also then throwing the music theory book out the window, you know? <laughs> yeah. I, I didn't know any music theory and I still don't really. Um, I didn't understand anything I was doing. It was just the way my brain worked with a severe amount of attention deficit disorder and like, <laughs> really just having to that was my brain you know yeah. um and so the, the other guys in the band uh would kind of chart it and tell me what i was writing and then i'd be like i don't know what the fuck you're talking about whatever <laughs> you know and, and the drummer would sit there and chart all wow do you know you're doing that da, da, da. and even like even now more recently like schools like berkeley did courses on the compositions and stuff and i'm like i should probably take it because i haven't <laughs> you know, I don't know. They're sitting there talking about all the complex theory and the break and the rules. And this I was like, I don't know any of that stuff. It's just as music just fans, and- we know that the records we love are more than just something we listen to. Right. Over time, they become a part of us and a part of our identity. And nobody knows this better than the people at Rockabilia, the best online shop for band merch, hands down. For more than 30 years, Rockabilia has offered the largest selection of officially licensed music merchandise available around the world. They do it all from authentic concert t-shirts to band hoodies and posters and even accessories from your favorite iconic artists. They do hats, backpacks, bags, pins, belts, you name it. They have it, as well as exclusive access to limited edition designs that you can only get through them and the artists that they partner with. Maybe you missed the merch table at a recent show and you're looking to treat yourself. Maybe you're looking to treat somebody else in your life with a gift card. Or maybe you're looking to outfit the children in your life with some new gear, whether they have two legs or four. Yes, they even have accessories for your pets. They have it all, so just head over to rockabilia.com or follow the link in our show notes. And for a limited time, all Record Process listeners can receive 10% off their order just by entering the code ROCKRECORD. That's all one word, ROCKRECORD at checkout. So we are extremely proud to have the people at Oxford Pennant as an official sponsor of the Record Process again here on Season 5. And I'm here to tell you about their new pennant and flag customizer. It's real simple. All you have to do is head to OxfordPennant.com to make your own custom flag on demand. Simply type in your favorite phrase, inside joke, lyric, whatever you want. Approve the preview and Oxford will print, sew and ship your flag straight to you from their beautiful headquarters in sunny Buffalo, New York. Creating and ordering your own custom flags from Oxford Pennant is actually so easy and affordable now that I'm concerned I'll have to start paying off my co-host Tom just to prevent him from putting every dumb thing I say this season on a flag. Seriously, I wouldn't put it past him. But with great power comes great responsibility, as we know, and that's exactly what Oxford Pennant is giving you here. All you have to do is head to OxfordPennant.com, search Customizer, and let the designing begin. So when you when you were writing, would so would would Chris uh, be charting these things out? Would you just like you're riffing together in a room and then he's charting it out and you're just remembering it, right? Or I just uh, remember it. Yeah, I, I never had any kind of. Sometimes I'd make rhythms when I was writing ideas with like sticks. Like I had my own little mm-hmm. your shorthand, kind of yeah. yeah, short, yeah. It'd be like a stick, you know. And I, I always thought like between kick and snare was always my. Yeah. way of thinking. And that's why a lot of the guitar parts in Dylan were always like high, low. It was always uh-huh. thinking like yeah. low and high and uh, like kick and snare. That's how I thought. That's how I always wrote in my head. And that's why often sometimes the, like the melodic nature of it was less important than 
the rhythm or stuff like that. Or, um, but yeah, so I had to create something that was going to satisfy the small scene of people that were expecting something really impressive at the time, which was way bigger than I thought I'd ever would ever happen. Yeah. Even, you know, mm-hmm. the small scene of people who are getting into this band was more than I ever could have imagined would ever hear anything I did. So at that time, there was a lot of pressure. Relapse Records, you signed it, it was one of my favorite labels. And so I think part of that calculating thing was me just really overcompensating for a severe amount of um, of imposter syndrome, you know? <laughs> like, Yeah. So like during this like daunting uh, writing process, like where was the inspiration coming from? Yeah, like was there anything in particular that you were like without – X, Y, and Z, <laughs> this record would never have been a, been a thing. I think it was that competition. Amazing. Yeah. Cool. You know, like, like I think under the running board was like, honestly, I'll be honest with you. It's like, okay, we were into these bands that were in the scene that were playing heavier, kind of interesting music that was polarizing and really in your face. And there was bands like Coalesce and, mm-hmm. um, and Botch and stuff like that. And I know where my head was like, this under the running board thing was like, okay, we're going to just fuck all those bands up. (laughs) Like I was just seriously, like I was like, fuck these, these bands are great, but like, I want to roll over them with a fuck, like a freight train. Yeah. And, um, and and how can I do that? that? Yeah. (laughs) And also at the same time, like this stuff is really satisfying my brain. That's so, has so much difficulty focusing. Like it's meditation. The more crazy, the more complex, the more fast and pummeling it is, the more I'm present. Mm. so like um you know the more kind of repetitive kind of stuff like that i start thinking about oh you know i'm just in it you know but the dillinger stuff i just kept pushing and pushing it uh often until the last minute before going to the studio because as it got more normal for me after months of working on it i'd have to make it more more confusing so that i could just (laughs) stay in it like so that my head would just stay challenged Mm -hmm. because um I had such a difficult time focusing. And so the Dillinger thing, the live performance, the amount of notes, the amount of stuff going on is was meditative to me. It's like, you know, the difference between boxing and running on a treadmill. Yeah, You know, you know, you're not, you're not thinking about if you left the iron on when you're boxing, you're worried about getting punched in the face. Yeah, That's it. (laughs) And with Dillinger, I wasn't thinking about if I left the iron on, I'm worrying about just like, like just falling into falling onto the train. And not falling, you know what I mean? Without falling yeah. off, you know? Yeah. And um, it was a combination of like, I want to be more brutal, more impressive, more confusing, more annoying than any other band that's doing this kind of thing. And like, there's this kind of like a, like a crazy mental disorder that's making me continuously evolve it and change it and change it and change it and change it and push it and push it and push it, and push it um, in order to stimulate myself. And, and also Chris was the same. We just kept pushing and pushing and pushing. Cause it was the only thing that made us feel content and, 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 and peace. It was peace for us. That's how yeah. we wow. felt peace. Wow. But yeah, I remember doing recording a demo for the first song off the album, sugar coated sour. And it has like kind of like a fusion solo in the middle. Mm-hmm. And I remember bringing that to Adam, our bass player who was in Kessler uh, in rehab. Uh, and he was a mess, you know, like, he had like a tracheotomy. Um, you know, at this point, we we're pretty sure he was never going to walk again, but it was really, really challenging to deal with. And um, I would go, I would bring him to, to rehab every morning. I remember playing him a demo of that and he was just like, okay, you're going to be fine. This is awesome. Like this is, yeah. you're, you're, you got, <laughs> you know, and he was very, very straight up. He was very cynical, very critical. He, he didn't beat around the bush. He was called Turkey guy. You know, he would be like, ah, this sucks. You know, he was very like dry like that. And when he heard that and he heard that solo, which would have typically been like the other guitar player's role. Yeah. He was like, okay, this is going to be good. You know, and that gave me that little extra confidence to be like, okay, because I knew he was such a fantastic musician. He was so critical and so, you know, honest. That definitely gave me uh, more confidence to keep going. Dude, you know, we talk about feedback all the time on this show and just in general, but it, it, it sometimes comes in interesting places. I mean, from a band dynamic, you're con- you're kind of getting constant feedback if you're just writing in the room with somebody else. But the weight of that kind of feedback, um, you know, from that band member, that friend with those circumstances, that has to really mean a lot. And that has to be something where it's like, yeah, I, I mean, that probably 
gave you that that little bit of like earnest to to be like okay we're we're putting our foot on the gas you know um, yeah. when when so many there were so many variables up in the air at that time it would have been very easy for you to maybe start second guessing things or you know do the like the classic creative is this shit even good you know yeah. um right but um but I love that because I think that moment in, in itself probably allowed the rest of it to unflow and you know it's it's interesting Ben I'm curious there's a book out there called Deep Work by by an author named Cal Newport, and it kind of is the whole the whole thing revolves around chasing the idea of of getting yourself into a flow state and, and the kind of work, uh, especially from a creative end, that you try to do that really requires that you know that it's not stuff you can just kind of access like spend five minutes here, spend ten minutes here. It's really I think the kind of work that as songwriters and, and performers and and any anybody that records uh, or, or makes music for a living starts to get in touch with and in tune with. And I, I just, I have to say it's incredible because the way you, uh, I was listening to you lay that out about your process and what you were trying to achieve this calm and, you know, this focus. And it's really the fact that Dillinger and this, this album specifically, and then everything else that I think probably then kind of came behind it is really an end result of you trying to continually exist in that flow state for yourself. And it's really unbelievable the way that you're now aware this many years later, looking back, but uh, can also describe it in that way, because I, I wish like they should go put that in that book as an aside, as a case study of like, this is what it can do. And and I think especially that's when you find that authentic self and that authentic work. And you don't try to like, you're not trying to fit anything in there. But, um, but that is brilliant and so incredible. And there are so many moments <laughs> on this record where I think yeah, it, it is the feeling of, okay, am I getting bored? We're we're gonna punch it. We're you know what I mean. Like we've been jabbing, we've been jabbing. They're expecting the jab. We're coming with a a right hook, you know, um, or we're coming with an uppercut, right? And it just the music has that feeling and the tension, the release, the dynamics. Uh, um, you know, it's all kind of there, and it all seems. What's interesting is when you say it that way, it seems so simple, you know? Um, but I don't think, I think a lot of people with such a complex genre and style, you know, ask the question, how can somebody write that? How can somebody afford that? And I, and it, when you saying that it, it seems so, so eloquent and so perfect. So I, I love that. I really appreciate that description of it. Well, I realized actually, I didn't answer your question now I'm thinking about it. Um, and that you bringing it in so nicely with your responses, um, you know, the process th that said, was like you said, you know, Tom, it wasn't like the time when people were using computers really to write music. You know, we are, we were starting in 97. We were writing that album at the end of 98. We were just in a room really writing this music and using a tape recorder um, to, to put it down and listen back. Yeah. It's, it's so weird now because, uh, you know, and now uh, moving forward, we learned how to use technology to make things more efficient, but we certainly, you know, the challenge was making sure that we didn't lose the aesthetic and the and the vibes that we had by not using technology, you know. Mm -hmm. But then that time, yeah, we really just had to get in a room and play and make this music. And then in the studio, I think we probably did. Uh, like Chris and I played together because it was really just Chris and I. And then Dimitri yeah. would come sing later afterwards. So yeah, Chris and I would would re kind of re record in a room, and I'd just play awful and sloppy. But the idea was to make sure the energy was there for Chris. And then I went in with Steve and. You know, it was extremely daunting because, as you said before, we didn't have a lot of resources. The money didn't allot us a lot of time in the studio. Um, there wasn't the technology to speed things along. You couldn't cut and paste anything. You know, there's no crossfading. There was nothing like that. And I had to do all the guitars and most of the bass. And Steve helped with the bass as well, thank God, mm. because, um, you know, there were some intricacies there that a bass player needed to play. Yeah. But on top of that, I had to learn how to play like a bass player. So thank God Steve was the producer because what I, I had a rude awakening that bass is not just <laughs> less strings. You know what I mean? Less string guitar, lower, yeah. boom. No, <laughs> yeah. it's not. Yeah. It's a totally different approach, you know? Yeah, I love that. Um, it, it glues everything together and it has to be things that would be choked with a guitar or have to open up and breathe with a bass. It's just, I learned a lot. That, that record was such an education and uh, keep in mind that it was also um, uh, during that time working a full time corporate job and in graduate school. Oh wow! At the same time, you had so your plate full. So your brain was was working overtime. <laughs> yeah, which is <laughs> wow. crazy to think now, um, because people my age, 
Like, I feel like I'm the same age. I hang like, yeah. out with young people yeah. and stuff like that. Like, and people my age then are like exhausted or think they can't handle like, you know, half, half of uh, credits for school yeah. and like two hours of work a week. They're like, I can't, uh, you know, like, and it's like, fuck, you don't understand. I'm like, trust me, I fucking understand. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? Have you heard those records? All right. I get it. <laughs> you know what's going on in my brain. Well, I think the difference is passion, you know? Yeah, like, of course. Like, you do what you have to do, and then you do what you need to do. And, and the music, and cal- like, like Dillinger was what I needed to do. Yeah. All that other stuff is what I had to do. And then every waking second, I was thinking about writing and making that music. And I was so excited to hear back the results. Like, that was the reward. I, I You know, and you guys know this. When you're making music and you're so – you hear it back, you're like, yes. You're like, you want to go listen to a car. You want to – and – um yeah, so like it was so rewarding to um, make that music and, and record it and go back and forth and type it and listen and then go to the studio and hear it come to life. That was what the excitement was and the rest was a bonus. Um, and I think because of that attitude, it's why it works. When you go into it with the idea that it's – with the feeling that like you just need to do this. This is meditation. This is what centers me. This is what makes me feel worthwhile. This is what makes me not want to go to bed even if I'm exhausted. Yeah. Like, like I can stay up all night. And, uh, to this day, it's like when I'm working on a, a score, I'm 47 years old. I've got fucking small children, you know? And like, uh, but I could stay up till four in the morning working on a score, get up at eight to take the kids to school and cannot wait to crack back into it. As soon as I drop them off. Like, I feel so excited to open that session up yeah. and keep yeah. working. Yeah. And so that's such a blessing to have that. And, um, you know, I, but that's truly, I think, what creates special something special and something that speaks to people um, because it has to be on, it has to be real. And so, you know, I, I, the calculating thing was real combination of um, imposter syndrome, mm-hmm. thinking like there's no way I could fulfill the shoes or, or, or step up to the plate uh, to the expectations, and also the need to just do it, the need to do it, and that's what created that album, and. Um, we did do it to tape. We did have to sit there and Steve did have to punch us very specifically when I had to come back in and do, and, and I was doing, you know, four or five guitar parts. Like if there was two guitar parts that were completely polyrhythmic and competing, you know, then Steve would be like, all right, we need to do three more on each side. Cause that's how it's going to sound heavy. You know, I'm like, Oh really? <laughs> no, it's not just more distortion. It's more guitars, you know? Yeah, and I'm yeah, like, yeah. okay. You know, it was a real education. And Truthfully, it was those sessions that the way he pushed me and the fact that he didn't let us cheat, and you know this, that trained me up to be able to play this stuff live. Like I probably went into those studios not able to play this stuff very well. And by the time I left, (laughs) I could. And with calculating, I still don't know how we did it because we didn't have that much time in the studio. We didn't have the technology. There were multiple players. It was just really just I just don't know how we, I don't no fucking idea how we got <laughs> well it and you and you mentioned you ran out you were kind of running out of time too and that you you know you had to find a way. I mean it always feels like it, no matter how long we have in the studio, it's always pushed till the eleventh hour, right? No matter how you draw it up. So, but y'all had to kind of get real creative there to finish this record a little bit at the end. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, so I know you mentioned earlier you were talking to me about the business side. You know, at that time, kind of the idea of the 360 deal started coming into play because that was really when the downloading thing and Napster really started really affecting the bottom line in the business. Labels needed to try to get a piece of every possible thing in order to justify the investment and the risk. So you know, Relapse obviously wanted merch stuff and things like that, and but they also wanted to buy our publishing, which was like, I don't know, what the fuck's that, you know? Right. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> right. And um, so I think we sold it for $2,000 to them just to finish the album, which, you know, was a big lesson because, you know, mechanical royalties and the amount of albums that sold, it was just like, ugh. <laughs> yeah, well, I think, I mean, not even, not to rub your nose, but I did see it's like even by like uh, 2013, uh, it was like, you know, it had cracked like six figures, you know, like over 100,000 plus albums sold. So I don't, I don't even know where it's at now, but you know, it's, it's a legendary album for sure. Yeah. And I mean, yeah. Rolling Stone in 2017 labeled it 56 greatest metal album of all time yeah um, like, which is ridiculous because i mean it sounds like <laughs> fucking noise to none of it but 
you know, that album still is the one that really set the, the, the base for us moving forward and, and is the one people talk about still to this day. And, um, you know, uh, I don't necessarily think it's our best album, but I am extremely proud of what we pulled off and um, how it kind of created the base for my life after that. And, um, you know, we did, uh, speaking of create, creatively, you know, there was something called ADATS, mm -hmm. which was like the, kind of the digital thing you could do. It was almost like, a, they look like cassette tapes. Mm -hmm. And that was how you could add more tracks when you didn't have enough on the reel. Like you could add these digital tracks through, um, these ADATs. And, uh, so we were doing like solos and things like that on ADATs and we were doing it at, um, like another band studio in town because we couldn't even, we didn't even have time to finish in that studio. And I think it was booked by other bands. So we went to like, uh, a friend's like home studio and we're doing more stuff on ADATs and like, we really were just trying to get it done. And, and Steve stepped up and I think he really enjoyed it. I think this was like something super stimulating for him and exciting. And, um, yeah, and I was totally unhappy with it. <laughs> <laughs> well, you mentioned something at the very beginning of like how by the time Dillinger was no more, y'all felt fulfilled. Y'all felt like this venting was complete at that time, because like you were saying that you have, uh, the music was like a meditation to, to get into that flow state at that point of time was there any like uh, at the time of like dissolution was there any great life change that you found that meditation elsewhere you mean that 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 kind of music as meditation changed my life or other kinds of things like that? Uh, yeah other other kinds of things that uh that like kind of fulfilled that that need yes to, like yeah yeah so what i learned is you know i started um I grew up in a household uh, with educators. My dad was an English professor and he taught literature and my mom worked at a university and, you know, they were intellectuals. Yeah. They didn't listen to the stuff of their time. They didn't know the Beatles. And as I went to Broadway shows and watched them be in book clubs and watch foreign films and all this shit. Right. They weren't like, popping the hood of the car. And my dad was like, let's go fix this engine. And there was no like, Hey, if somebody touches you, you gotta, you gotta <laughs> show them what's up and you punch them back. You know, it was yeah. like, keep your hands to yourself. Don't attempt to even hang that picture. That's for a handyman. What are you doing? <laughs> how do you know how to use that? You can't use that tool. You know, uh, it was just very much like that. And then I, I started Dillinger and I got in a van, a dirty van and started like, spitting and bleeding all over people and getting in fights with skinheads in the Midwest. And like, just, it was like a real interesting thing. My parents thought I was an alien. They were like, mm. Who, whose kid are you? You know, like, you know, I was coming home with black eyes and, and yeah. just like, you know, broken bones. And I was doing entire tours with broken ribs and things like that. And, you know, breaking down in the middle of nowhere and getting under a van, learning how to fix things. And, and, um, it, you know, the band was just so challenging and so pummeling in so many ways, <laughs> in so many ways. Uh, it, it was, it was so intense. It was so intense in every way. And, um, but one of the things I realized when, when I slowed down the band and it, it really started during the end, during the end of the, in about 20, the beginning of 2017, um, as things started to slow down, I realized man, like I need to fulfill this in another way. And I started like fighting. I started doing mm. um, like, uh, and, and not like jujitsu and things like that. Like, um, like, uh, like the Israeli stuff, mm. combat, anti-terrorist, kill someone stuff, you know? <laughs> like, yeah. And I was going through hard times and bad divorce and I just felt weak, you know? And that, and I was like, I got to feel power again that I felt when I first started Dillinger where I was just like by hook or by crook I got to just dive in and so I started fighting and I started doing boxing lessons and I was doing it with a friend of mine who was actually from the hardcore scene he was in a band called Resurrection this guy little Dave they called him and he was uh the guy in the scene that was like he was like this little and we'd go to city gardens and uh, he would be like standing on the side of the pit and he'd see like five guys get into a, a fight and he'd be like, okay, 
training time, you know, <laughs> almost like in that uh, Christian Bale and Batman where he went to the jail yeah, yeah, yeah. in order to like get his ass kicked yeah. in order to like, he would be like, awesome. And he'd jump in the fucking pit. And before you, there'd be like fucking five dudes on the floor. And you'd be like, how the hell did that, you know, like he was that guy before martial arts, before everyone was doing this. Nobody did. You did Taekwondo and you broke a board and that was it. And then you went on and you never went back and you're like yeah. five. That's what people were doing back then. This guy was training in every kind of Kung Fu and this, anything you can do. And, and like going into the worst areas and starting fights. And, um, and eventually he um, ended up, you know, starting his own school and teaching and things like that. And I started working with him individually and because he was my friend and because he was kind of a dick and knew I wouldn't sue him, I mean, he beat the fucking shit out of me mm. all the time. And um, <laughs> that was like, okay, all right, I need to stay. And like I said, it's like the difference between boxing and a treadmill is like, you can't daydream. You can't. It, and, and all that stuff became like Dillinger for me. It, it, it's like I put my hands down, he punched me in the face. That's it. And my shoulders are burning and I'm exhausted and I just want to die. And I put my hands down, I'm getting punched in the face. Yeah. That's it. Wow. Like, that's it, you know? And, and he didn't hold back. And that kind of stuff was like that physicality, that kind of concentration, that kind of intensity and anxiety was the closest thing I found to Dillinger uh, as I knew that was slowing down. And then on top of that, this is completely opposite, but I started doing transcendental meditation with uh i i trained with nancy cook de harar she actually trained the beatles wow um in this stuff and and she died uh eventually uh not that long after i trained with her but she was very old mm. and um she uh her and the maharishi brought med that to the states before i was doing all this dillinger and the boxing stuff i could have never done that because there's no way i could calm my brain enough to even meditate like impossible totally, impossible yeah <laughs> what she taught me was like don't judge how you do it don't be like oh i could do it for three seconds and then i started thinking of something i hate myself i suck no just do your best and keep doing it and doing it and then judge your life how's your life now take a look right. how was things you know and um when i started doing that as well i found all this crazy serendipity happening that gave me a confidence that uh just do your thing and do it well and manifest and everything will work out. And, and it was really crazy because when I started doing this transcendental stuff, it would literally be like, I was listening to an artist a ton and then like I'd be doing the meditation and all of a sudden someone get a call or something and now I'm making music with them. Like how the fuck that, like I never, how did that happen? You know, it's like what connection, yeah. <laughs> you know, and I'm not yeah. a superstitious person. I'm not, but something about that opening that door created a lot of opportunity. So when Dillinger was ending, all that stuff came in very handy for me to move to the next level, the next stage of my life. Yeah. And you know, what's interesting too, uh, that is just, I mean, Ben, that's so powerful in the juxtaposition of those two disciplines and lanes and practices, but how they do share that crossover, man, that's a lot to think about. And that's incredible. But I, I, I love, and I can't help thinking after hearing you unpack this whole story, how the things that you learned about yourself in Dillinger and became aware of over the course of that career that all kind of started with these EPs and then and this record at hand, it feels like it did its own thing in like a, you know, call it like an emotional, musical and physical fight club kind of way to like bring you uh, to a place where, yeah, I mean, you were you were ready for that. And I, it's interesting that you talk about, um, you know, that lane, that lane and, and going and finding that again in other places. Uh, um, you know, as the same person, but also a different person. And you would put that Dillinger stuff out into the world, whether you like it or not, your brain had done that. You know what I mean? You had created it and you had gotten, uh, you had gotten into the, the arena, into the studio, uh, on stage and, and kind of, and just gone for it, you know? Um, and I think that's at the, at the heart of it is like you, you know, you talk about manifesting these things, you put all this stuff into the universe and that's why it, it you know, it gives people something to know that they want to gravitate towards you for. And uh, I think that's a, a lovely place to end it here. And I, I can't thank you enough again for coming on and, and chatting with us and sharing all that, because I, I'm going to take that with me the rest of the day and, and just kind of like digest and download all of that, um, 
And, uh, and I, I really think anybody that's listening, whether or not they can casually listen to a Dillinger record or not, you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, I think is maybe in, in its own way, um, aside from the point here, but man, uh, thank you so much, Ben. This has been awesome. No, thank you. It was, it was a fun chat. I, uh, we, it was a little different interview and I enjoyed it. Thank you. Amazing. So Ben mentioned growing up in a house with educators, and we commonly view educators as those who teach us to follow the rules and those who seek to instill a disciplined regimen in their subjects, right? And rules can give you a direction in the beginning. They can serve as a shorthand for knowing what to expect when you follow them in a step-by-step process. Follow this rule of mathematics or this rule of music theory, and you get this expected outcome. But the real magic, I think, happens when you discover what's possible with the courage to break those rules or by refusing to even learn them in the first place. Kind of like Ben in this case, who didn't let a lack of music theory knowledge stop him from creating. And I think this is an incredible reminder that the deepest essence of an album is what happens between the notes what the performer chooses to do in the moment that isn't notated on any page. The rules a band is willing to break in order to keep a listener against the ropes and to transport them beyond what their wildest expectations could prepare them for. This is what the Dillinger Escape Plan did masterfully, and that is why so many fans in their community and even across all genres still respect and appreciate Calculating Infinity to this day. So don't let the rules hold you down in your pursuit of making work that should first and foremost satisfy something inside of you. That's all you can really control. And the only guarantee you have is that we'll be right back here next week on The Record Process.